Destination Africa brought to you by Standard Bank. Welcome back to Destination Africa and still in discussion with me is Andrew Maggs, an independent consultant and Surendra Bhatia, Deputy MD of Ati River Mining, joins us from our studios in Nairobi, Kenya as well. We're putting the spotlight on Africa's construction industry. Andrew, we were speaking about margin pressure as a result of heightened competition in the first part of the show and it's something that's further exacerbated by the cost of doing business and that as a result of infrastructure def deficiencies, power costs, cost of labor, one has to assume that it's not a very enticing picture that we're painting here in terms of uh, you know, enticing investors to doing business on the continent. Alicia, yes. I mean, there the, the are huge constraints. And um, you know, for any you know, major, well, l let's use the mining sector as an example. Um, to construct a new mine, obviously there needs to be support infrastructure. A, mon a mine requires you know, water, mm -hmm. uh, power supply. Um, now, you can't expect the mining company to generate its own power. So, um, you know, when that development decision is made to go into a country to spend, whether it's, you know, $500 million on a new mine, is there going to be a reliable and adequate supply of power and water? Can that be guaranteed? And uh, in many countries in Africa, unfortunately, that's not the case. I, you know, spoke of this in the first part of this, uh, this program, but, um, you know, power being the, the power sector being you know, the outstanding uh, sector which requires investment. And um, you know, 30 countries across the continent are experiencing severe power crises. Yeah. And uh, Sahindra will you know, tell you that in East Africa they certainly haven't been spared. Um, so you know, constraints on the ground, you know, as I said, relating to power, water, uh, but then also constraints of an administrative nature as well. And mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's something we can touch on a bit later, just the skills to actually Absolutely. implement projects properly. Absolutely. Well, uh, Surendra, I mean, this is something you've certainly grappled with to the extent that uh, stiff competition has come through by importers of cheaper cement, uh, you know, where they afforded cheaper production in other countries like China. How do you handle, as a cement player, the cost factor and mitigate against that risk? Well, over the last uh, couple of years, the only way we have been able to mitigate the high cost of certain inputs is being far more efficient and bringing in internal efficiencies in our production process. Uh, just as an example, the power cost has been going up uh, for the last three years continuously. And what we have been trying to do is to bring in uh, power efficiency in our plant so that we can use lesser and lesser amount of units in our uh, production process. So the only way I think you can uh, uh, mitigate the impact of uh, cheaper imports or higher input costs in the local country is to build up internal efficiencies in your production process. Absolutely. Well, uh, Andrew, you know, imports aside, I came across an article at the start of the year saying that Chinese companies now dominate the African construction sector and have continued to grow over the past few years. And that despite the kind of economic woes the global economy it's, uh, f uh, has faced and it's China's role in financing Africa's infrastructure uh, projects that's actually supported this. So what have you made of that kind of strategy that Chinese investors have employed uh, vying into uh, the African construction? Industry. Well, Alicia, what we've seen over the last few years is a dramatic increase um, from the Chinese government in funding infrastructure on the continent. It's difficult to quantify. I mean, the figures range from you know, 10, 15, 20 billion. Um, and why I say difficult to quantify, because frequently that funding is tied to, for lack of a better term, offset agreements, um, oil or base metals in return for funding for infrastructure. And um, I think from a South African perspective a few years back it was you know do we compete you know against them or with them and I think most were in the camp of you know let's let's go head to head with them and I think that's that's turned can and we yes can we go head to head with them because I mean at this stage we've got uh, you know Chinese governments and institutions rivaling the World Bank the IMF in terms of developmental uh, outreach so unpack a strategy like this and the viability of other countries actually venturing down this path because you'd have to have significant financial power and muscle Alicia short answer no I don't think so and uh, I think that gives impetus to um, those 
companies that are looking to work in joint venture with Chinese firms. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, by way of example, um, Promet, which is a, a firm of South African uh, consultants um, uh, in the mining sector, uh, back end of last year they went into joint venture with Dadi. Promet Dadi is now the new operating company, and um, you know, it's given I think both those uh, companies um, it, it's win-win. I mean, Promet are exceedingly skilled at their job, and uh, you know now with the muscle from uh, China behind them, yeah. um, it's it appears to be you know well worth their while to pursue that sort of strategy. Well, Surendra, you know, we've got the likes of China, Exim Bank, uh, you know, uh, being granting uh, government concessional loans. We've had China Development Bank also having increased its financing when it comes to the construction and infrastructure development space on the continent. Are there important facets that African financiers possibly need to relook at this stage? Well, uh, there are two aspects to that. One is uh, on commercial terms, yes, the Chinese options which are available when we look at them within a basket of options which are available to us, yes, the Chinese options are very, very attractive. Now, can we as African investors match them? Uh, on the face of it, the Chinese uh, terms are very cheap, but what we need to calculate is what is the total cost of that capital for any project? and. As a, a user of funds for various projects and various uh, plants which we are putting up, what we look is what is the total cost at the end of the funding period, what it is going to cost us. Now, uh, can uh, the African investors have a joint venture with them? Can we draw on their resources, their financial strength to support our investment in the African continent? These are questions which need to be considered very, very carefully. But yes, there's a excellent potential which is available through these Chinese financial institutions. Those are very important questions that certainly need to be answered, Andrew, because often tied to these Chinese loan agreements is that public tenders for construction and civil engineering uh, projects would be awarded primarily to Chinese state-owned enterprises approved by the Chinese government. Uh, furthermore, no less than 50% of uh, you know, procurement to, uh, in terms of equipment, materials, technology, services must come from China itself as well. And that brings with it a significant amount of risk, one would assume, to African economies? Well, yes and no. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, fresh funding, whatever the source, um, and, you know, if it's going to be used to build infrastructure, at the end of the day is going to alleviate poverty, um, you know, that should be welcomed. Mm -hmm. And if there are tie-back agreements, uh, conditionalities attached to that, um, well, you know, the pros and cons of that could be discussed uh, you know, at, at another time. But um, you know, I'm in the camp. Um, you know, do you welcome or do you you know reject Chinese involvement in Africa? And um, I think those that re that now reject it are in a in a minority. Yeah. And uh, again, I refer to you know our clientele, where I think there's a, a an understanding and acceptance of their presence on the continent and a willing to willingness to 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 work with Chinese firms. Especially where you've got inefficiencies that plague development of the sector. I mean, we speak about infrastructure constraints on the one hand, but on the other hand, you've got to acknowledge the skills deficiencies that persist. Fair enough. I, I accept that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Surendra, facilitating this, you know, where uh, sourcing, importing materials and equipment from China makes sense is low cost and then tax breaks that are often offered by African countries. What's your view on the regulatory system out there and the kind of playing field that uh, players are operating within? Well, um, again, you know, it, uh, this is a very, very specific question. And, uh, you know, every project would have different terms and conditions which are attached to that. Now, a number of times uh, with the concessions which uh, they may be given to the Chinese, obviously the level f uh, playing field is not there. But then if we look at it from the larger picture, as long as we can contribute to the development of Africa, if we can put the infrastructure in place, which is going to alleviate poverty, if we can put the power, which is going to light up the villages in the rural areas, 
I think it's a risk worth taking. Mm -hmm. Certainly something that cannot be ignored, Andrew, is that as these Chinese companies begin to win more private client contracts as well, they develop local uh, you know, alternatives to Chinese suppliers, resulting in deeper integration with domestic economies. What has been very popular as well is a regional approach because the environments, legal systems, and then uh, you know, entire business processes of the surrounding uh, companies are very similar. Uh, what are you making of uh, or, or what's your view on the regulatory environment from a regional perspective? Well, regional integration is a must. And um, you, know, you look at, I think, at Donald Kabaruk, who's been you know, head of the African Development Bank, who is a strong advocate for uh, developing regional infrastructures, um, whether it be um, you know, power generation, which then through transmission lines could be mm -hmm. shared among countries, um, or uh, transboundary highways, um, it, it, it's something that, that, that has to happen. And also, you know, accept the, the, the fact that, uh, particularly for landlocked countries, um, there is a dependence, whether they like it or not. And, uh, you know, let me use transport as an example, where, to speak frankly, the, the transport um, infrastructure in Africa, by and large, is, um, is inadequate. And um, if you look at you know, the cost of imports uh, to some of these landlocked countries, um, you know, it can be yeah. as much as um, 65, 70 percent, you know, added to the eventual cost of an imported product. Now, um, it's then essential to make sure that, um, you know, from, you know, ports through to, um, you know, whether it be by road or rail, eventually to its destination, um, investment is made in, in infrastructure which is which is shared. Yep. Uh, well, Surendra, we've certainly seen some industries benefit from the East African Common Market Protocol, specifically creating an East African hub. The benefits as uh, you've seen it as a player in the space? Uh, the market size has grown, economies of scales have come in, and more importantly, uh, you know, we have been able to access uh, the uh, newer markets much freely. I mean, even the non-trade barriers which were there, non-tariff barriers have started disappearing. So in pure terms, yes, I mean, our market size has grown, uh, our ability to uh, grow has uh, grown, and in terms of uh, our accessibility, it's grown. Accessib accessibility to funds, accessibility to customers, accessibility to new projects, in general, it's had a very positive impact. And that just proving the merit. With that, gentlemen, we've come to the end of today's show. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, Andrew Maggs is an independent consultant, while Surendra Bhatia is Deputy MD of Ati River Mining.